motivated you to enter this race? Who did you talk to and, and for how long were you considering uh, a run? Uh, the reason I decided to do this is because I'm a city resident. I've been for 45 years and I've just got really frustrated in my own neighborhood seeing the deterioration of the city, seeing the deterioration of the downtown for go over the years. What part of the town did you live in again? I was born and raised um, down in Mayflower section and now I live in Rolling Mill Hill and I've been there 27 years. And you know, I understand the frustration, but there's a, a, a frustration and then there's the impetus to, all right, I'm gonna put my name in there and see what I can do. When did you make that decision and who did you talk to about it before you did it? Um, I talked to some of my friends who were, you know, in really involved in the city and other aspects. And um, my actual first choice of career moves was to become a police officer because of the crime and corruption in the city. And I felt I could do a lot of good there, and it's something I've always been interested in doing. And I did take the test twice. I am still currently on a list to be hired for the city of Wilkes-Barre. And it was kind of once I didn't get hired, I thought, well, where else can I do the most good? for both the residents, neighborhoods, and the downtown. you know where you are on that list, Lisa? 13th. 13. 13. Mm -hmm. And if I'm correct, you previously ran for city controller, and that was 2007? Yeah, that was um, a combination, sort of. I started out with city council in the primary, mm -hmm. and then it ended up um, Mr. Urban uh, won both seats, so he had to forfeit one. So he had kind of asked me to put my name for controller. Oh, okay. That's how it ended up on there. Um, and, uh, your parents live in the city currently, or they own property in the city? No, they live in the city, okay. yes. Um, given your experience here, uh, you know, your lifetime here, is the city better or worse today than it was 10 years ago? The downtown, I would say, is better, but the neighborhoods, I don't believe, are any better. I just think they've deteriorated drastically. Was there a high point in your lifetime for the city? Um, probably when I, well, when you were a kid, I didn't really realize, you know, you don't take notice to the infrastructure of a city. But it was, you know, when I started getting older and, you know, decided once I got married uh, whether I wanted to stay here or leave, you know, then you start really noticing that the downtown's empty and your neighborhoods are being full of criminals and it's when I bought my house and had children that's when I really started taking notice to the city. So when you talk about neighbors deteriorating you're speaking about crime? Yeah crime and just the general people you have moving into your neighborhoods and the rental properties and the low-income housing. The, the, the reason I ask is because I've had this conversation with people before and it seems years ago people inherited their parents' homes. And there was a home that was in the family and they were prideful about that home for years. And now, thank God, people are living longer. By the time you inherit your parents' home, you're 50 years old, you know, and you already have your own home. And so that property then becomes sold by the children, rented by the children. And that pride in that neighborhood doesn't exist uh, as much as it once did, and, you know. And I don't know what the solution to that is. And that's why I asked if you thought it was a crime problem or just what you had said, just the people that live there. And I think most how, how do you address something like that, which just seems to be a trend of life right now? Uh, that's tough. I mean, I, well, I don't agree with the city or state giving away all, everything for free because I don't believe in like the low-income housing. You're not going to attract good, decent families in there. I mean, that might be something you could look at on a, even a say, state level where HUD gives these vouchers out to these people for low-income housing. I mean, I'm not talking about segregating people, but, you know, when you have low-income, non-employed people living next to people who are getting up every morning and going to work and taking pride in their property, you have to look and try to do something between that difference. Because I know just from my own experiences. I my, I've come from a hard-working family. My husband and I both have jobs and I live next door to a rental property where they're partying all night and they I'm going to work at 5 a.m. and they haven't even gone to bed yet. And the cops are at their house three times a week. So I don't know exactly what the answer is but we can look into the state and see if there's any way we can look at the uh, way they give out these vouchers for low-income housing. Yeah, that's I guess what I was, if the cops are there three times a week, what else can you do? You know, that's why it seems like it's a tough 
right. Well, and even something like that. I know there's ordinances on the books in the city of Wilkesbury that after the cops are there three times, they're supposed to become nuisance properties. And you can run the risk of closing them down or even, you know, taking control of them. But I know based from what I know of the police department, I mean, everything is handwritten. I mean, so if Officer Smith is there and then Officer Jones is there and then Officer, you know, Williams is there, they don't collaborate with each other. It's just a paper trail and you kind of have to accidentally find the trend. And I think that's something the police department can look into is a better way of computerizing a system to keep better track of these properties. It, it's a far leap to get to where you, you know, is the nuisance property and, the, and I, the city takes control. How do you get people, how do you get the, 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 the property owners and, or, or residents that you think are, should be in the city, how do you get them to come and invest their lives in, and, and, and invest in property here? How do, you, how do you get that? How do you make it attractive for people? Well, like I said, try to get the bad ones out first because you're not with the crime and the, you know, not so savory people in your neighborhood, you're not going to attract good families. And if there's no economy downtown and you don't have businesses for people to come and have jobs with, they're not going to move here. Other questions on that? Um, I'm wondering, since winning the Republican uh, nomination, and, and I think things become a little more real, a little more possible at that point, um, that, that you'll be successful in November, I'm wondering what you've done to prepare for the job um, since that time. Attending council meetings, talking to city employees, online research about what other Pennsylvania cities are doing to attract people. Does, uh, does the campaign allow you to do that kind of stuff? Yeah, I've done all of the above. I've met with uh, union reps, I've met with different departments within the city, I've gotten copies of the budget, I've talked to you know a lot of city employees, I've been online doing investigating on ways to bring revenue into the city. Uh, what is the city's budget ballpark figure right now? Do you know? Uh, 43 million. And do you know the uh, current number of uh, employees, again ballpark? City of Wilkesbury. No, I, I have a list at home though of all the city employees and their salaries, and but I've never really counted them up. Uh, on your Facebook page, it says, "If elected, I will focus on the issues that citizens have told me are important to them." What are you hearing when you talk to them? What's at the top of their list? Well, they don't believe that the current administration is open or honest. They believe there's a lot of corruption out there, misappropriation of your city taxes. Crime. <laughs> I mean, people are asking me, how could you pave a road and three months later it's got cracks down the middle of it and it's falling apart? And where did, do you remember where that took place? Uh, Lehigh Street. So when they tell you these are their issues, what's your response? How, what can you offer them as a candidate? <laughs> I mean, I, I, the lady pointed out the cracks in the road and told me when it was paved. And what I would do is, I mean, you, you have to look into your contractors that you are hiring by the city. I mean, it just seems to me that talking to city employees, there are two general contractors that their names come up in every conversation. Maybe we're not getting the best product from these people or the best work. Maybe we should look in other contractors. And I think um, some people would say fixing up the neighborhoods is, is a great concept to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to pave streets and, and make the people who are there more comfortable and, and enjoy their properties. But five, five winters, seven winters later, those streets are torn up and you, you don't have anything of value to show for it. Whereas if some of these projects are done downtown, for instance, potentially you get new businesses Potentially, you get people moving into the city, increases your revenue. Mm -hmm. I mean, just um, curious about the emphasis on neighborhoods right now, and, and how you think that would help the, the budget essentially. Well, the neighborhoods are where the people. You know, I mean, I know you generate most of your revenue from your businesses, but I mean, the taxpayers are entitled to a decent place to live and just your basic necessities that you're paying taxes for. 
uh, one of your uh, proposals was establish a, a helpline uh, so that uh, residents could call and, and they'd be filtered to the appropriate department head. I'm wondering how that's different than if a resident calls City Hall today. Well, right now what I'm hearing is that you get a big runaround pretty much from City Hall. It's one of those, I'll get back to you, we'll look into that. And this way, I think if you have a direct line with the mayor and um, suppose it's a DPW problem and you get that department head involved in it, you can come to a quicker resolution to the problem and hold them accountable for getting back. Would, we staff, would that be 24 hours a day or business hours? Or how, when would you staff that or how, who, who would answer that phone? Well, I don't know if you could do it 24-7, but I mean definitely during business hours. But you know, if there's a problem on a weekend, I mean there should be someone available. I mean, in my philosophy, when I want to run for mayor, I'm not going to be a Monday through Friday 9 to 5 mayor. I want to be a 24-7, very hands-on. I mean, if people need me, I mean, you should be accessible. I'm just wondering how you're going to make that process work. You know, who, who's going to, is it going to be one person at a set phone? Is it going to be, you know, when in a time of crisis, there'll be lots of calls coming in, so there'll be lots of busy signals. I just wondering how that, how that would work. Well, I, there should be a list of uh, every city employees. I mean, if their city has cell phone numbers, you know, for all their departments, I mean, they should be accessible to the residents. So, okay, so the, all, you, you have all the cell phone numbers for all workers? or all As long as the city workers. is paying the bill on them, yeah. I'm not talking about personal cell phone oh, numbers. But you, but you, 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 it sounded like it was a set phone line or a set answer. Or well, I mean, a direct line right to the mayor, you know, city hall. And then from there, just transfer the call to the appropriate. But that's not, you don't think that's happening now? No. Okay. Mm -mm. Uh, one of your other proposals, um, you had concern about the number of vacant lots in the city, uh, obviously, and, and would like to encourage, cons well, is your idea to encourage the construction of homes on those vacant lots or use them for other purposes? Or, or? Well, there's a number of things you can do with the vacant lots. I mean, one thing I would like to impose is the city doing their own towing. I mean, because of the conflicts right now that are in the paper every day with the current way the city does the towing, for lack of better words. Um, you know, I would look into the city, you, like you said, you have so many vacant lots. You can do your own in-house towing, that way you don't have to worry about a contract and you'd be responsible for the towers and you would collect all the revenue from that function. Whether it's the towing fees, the impound fees, and you have enough vacant lots, put a fence around them and use it as an impound yard. Do we have to hire people to do that? We can hire Bob Kodlebowski and Leo Glodzik. <laughs> But as city kidding. employees? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I believe there would be enough revenue generated from the city doing it in-house. I mean, you're getting $50,000 a year, and obviously there's more money in that because you wouldn't want the contract if that's all it were worth. Uh, do you have a platform statement when you're out there meeting with people and shaking hands to say, these are the things that I would work toward? Um, yeah, I just the better of the whole city, you know, run an open, honest government, be responsive to the people. Uh, one of the things that I think came up in an earlier interview, and I just wondered if you could flush out for me, you said you'd like to extend some city services into weekends. Could you give me the details on that? Do you, do you remember what it was specifically? Um, well, there's some jobs that just aren't 9 to 5 jobs Monday through Friday. I mean, um, like, well, for example, animal enforcement was one um, that came right off the top of my head. I mean, dogs are barking every hour of the day and night, you know, and you can't wait till Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Um, I'm not really sure what my other one was. And uh, another thing that you thought um, it would be wise to take a look at was curbing the outsourcing. Was that for the towing in particular, or are there other areas that you think that could be? Well, I think whatever you can do in-house would definitely be less expensive if that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, using our city manpower rather than outsourcing everything. Um, do you have any uh, concrete proposals for saving money? A lot of what we've talked about so far might potentially cost money. If we're talking about a helpline. You know, it depends. Maybe. Some of these things could be uh, in-house, but 
um, paving the, the streets and the neighborhoods and so forth. Do you have any examples of where money could be saved? Any thoughts on what areas in particular should be looked at? Well, I'm not the mayor right now, and I don't know exactly where all our money is being spent. But I don't believe it's being spent in the best ways possible. So once I become mayor, I will sit down and look at where we can save money. I mean, there are a lot of rumors and accusations, and I didn't really want to go into this, but of misappropriated funds and bonuses and, you know, dealings that are going on. And these are all things that need to be looked into. Because if the money's being mishandled, there may be a lot more money out there than you know. And to go to City Hall and ask for a right to know of the city budget and tell people exactly what we have year to date, you don't get an answer. So we really don't know how much money the city has or doesn't have. Have you, have you put in a request for a, the, the city budget and not received? I have a copy of the city budget at home. Which le leads me to a question. There's a uh, $400,000 appropriated for the east side landfill. Well, if I'm correct, the east side landfill is where the new casino is built. Why is there $400,000 appropriated for an east side landfill which was closed years ago? And my question is, are we actually paying that? These are things that need to be looked into when I talk about the mishandling of the money. Well, like I said, we don't, we don't know if that's mishandled. We just don't know, understand what that allocation is for. Right, exactly. And so, it's, but let me get back to the, the budget. You, you, you made an allegation that people go to ask for the budget and they put in a right to no request, they get no answer. Do we know that's been the case? Do, do you know of somebody that put in a request and didn't get a response? Yes. Who, can you tell me any specifics about who that was? It'll come out in the media very soon. Well, we're the media, so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, th there's quite a few people I know who have put they, in... They put in right to no request and didn't get a response? Yes. And a lot of it has to do with towing contracts and the checks for the city towing. They've put in right to no's. I mean, I don't know how long Leo's had the contract. I think it was seven years, and they've gotten a response for three checks. Can, and you made an allegation about bonuses or misappropriation of, of funds. Can you be more specific about that? Because that's, right, that's, that's an allegation, but there's... I need to back that up. Well, I know that city employees who are married, they get a $2,000 a year buyout for not taking city health coverage. Well, there's a couple thousand dollars you can save there because there are quite a few married couples that, you know, work within the city. So you need to change the policy then? Mm-hmm. That, for example, so, so, if, um, so if you hired somebody, you'd say, I'm give, we give insurance if you were hired as a city worker, you'd get insurance, but your spouse wouldn't. Because that's how that buyout works. Because they have insurance somewhere else, it saves the city money because they're not using the insurance. So that's why they get that $2,000. Some companies do that to some degree or another. If you don't take your spouse or your family doesn't take it, then you save the company money. That's why they do that. So there's a benefit there probably to the city. I don't know the specifics, but typically that's how it works. Right. Oh, I, so I don't agree with it because, you know, and, and but it's... But you change the policy then if you hired somebody, you would, their, their family or their spouses wouldn't share in the insurance? I get that. That's a question, yeah. You know. I wouldn't give them the $2,000. I don't think you should be entitled to it. So they... So I mean, they, if you're they, already on your husband's policy, which if I become mayor, my husband already works for the city. I'm on his insurance policy. If I become mayor, why should I get $2,000 well, for not taking let's it? Say, let's just say man and woman. Man gets hired by the city. Mm -hmm. His wife, his spouse is, works for another company, um, and they can get insurance from their own company. That saves the city money. So I guess my question is, would you change the policy for employees that their spouses don't get insurance, their family members don't get insurance under the city? I, I guess that's, that's where this heads. Well, my understanding is it's only the married couples that work within the city that get this. Okay. Okay. And then any, uh, and that's, is that the bonus you're referring to? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, you referred earlier to rumors and accusations of misappropriation of money. Do you have any credible evidence, and has that been taken to the authorities, or is it, like you say, a rumor? Well, I'm not taking anything to the authorities because I'm trying to run for mayor here, and I just want to clean up, you know, these, and make sure these accusations go away, if they are, in fact, you know, true. But it's something that I would definitely look into. And I mean, I've talked to people who have 
you know, filed reports with both state and federal investigators, and they're pretty much pending. Do you have a management experience in any of your prior jobs? Yeah, at my current job. And that's Lord and Taylor? Yes. What's your, your actual, I, I saw many references to the fact you worked there, but what's your job title there? What do, what do you do? I'm in charge of returns and a transfer shipping lead. So what would the title be again uh, of your job, your title? It, I'm technically called a lead, which is a supervisor, which the word has gone away, but uh, of like a lead our department. Like a team kind of that yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. A lead. We don't have supervisors anymore. <laughs> They're gone. How many uh, people? Would, how many people do you currently manage, or was the management it, years ago? No, I still do it. Um, I'd say our current department has about 20, 25 people. And what do you feel are your uh, strengths? Things that you would uh, apply to the mayoral position? Characteristics that you have? Well, I'm. I'm blatantly honest, <laughs> which sometimes can be a bad thing. Um, you know, I'm hardworking. I, you know, try to always do what's right. Uh, I guess following up on the blatantly honest, there, there have been some suggestions that, that you can't be as candid as maybe you want to be during this campaign because your opponent, the mayor, obviously is, is your husband's boss and you're on the list to try to be a city police officer. Is there, is there truth to that? Do you feel like you're holding back at any time? At first when I started doing this, I did, but now, no, I don't. Because there were meetings within my husband's department, you know, that any time they speak to him, he needs to have a union rep with him. So I'm pretty secure in that. And uh, will you retest for a police department in 2012 when that comes up again, do you think? No, because I'll be the mayor then. <laughs> Um, but then I could technically hire myself and take a leave of absence. <laughs> no, I wouldn't go. do that. <laughs> um, do you think Tom Layton's been an effective mayor in, in any ways? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that a little bit? I mean, oh, I'll give credit where credit is due. I mean, he's made the downtown look really nice. But I just don't think we have enough businesses down there to, you know, have all these nice buildings that are vacant. What, what would you do to attract more businesses downtown? Well, I would try to give them, you know, like I, right now I believe we have what those KOZ tax breaks. I mean, look into that to get the businesses to move down. Work with the existing businesses, first of all, to stay put. I mean, accommodate them in any way we can. And then use tax breaks to get more businesses downtown. Do you have any uh, theories as to why some of the build, that even the new storefronts down around the movie complex have been empty since the movie theater opened, what, four years now? Um, do you have any idea why people haven't gone in there? I mean, a couple have, but there's still, I think there are a few that have never been occupied. Sure. I'm, I'm guessing, I mean, I would say probably the rent. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the rent is on one of those, but they move in and a couple of them have already moved out. I mean, why they're not being rented, I, I really don't know. But I would definitely push to get them rented. That was all sort of seen as the cornerstone to the revitalization, is getting that going down there. And it's been slow going, so I just wanted to yeah. your thoughts on that. Lisa, how's your uh, uh, treasury for your campaign going? Have you been raising money? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about how much you have going in? Um, not as much as the current mayor, but a couple thousand. Or right now, uh, there were some expenses, so I believe it's like at fifteen hundred right now. And and what's your game plan as far as how you're going to you know wage your campaign going forward here until uh, November? Uh, what are you going to do uh, besides the door to door and and face to face contact reports? Doing anything else? Uh, um, I've had some meet and greets, and I'm going to have a couple fundraisers and um, 
Just basically a lot of advertising, whatever I can get out there, whatever I can afford. Uh, do you find that to be somewhat of a disadvantage when you look at the mayor and he's got a pretty good war chest there? Do you find that as a disadvantage for you to try and, you know, gain votes? Uh, how no. important do you think that is? I don't think money really matters. I think it's being, you know, honest and having the people believe in what your ideas are. More questions on the campaign? Uh, I, I was curious because of your kind of close involvement with the police department and, and those issues, that was one of the things that motivated you early on was you, you wanted to be a police officer to help the city. And you, you noted that crime is a significant what you perceive as a significant problem. Do you have ideas about changing the policing in the city right now, ways that it could be improved? Um, well, first of all, I think within the police department, I mean, they've been promised everything under the sun, and all they've gotten are four new police cruisers, which aren't totally equipped. They have no transmission radios in them. And then they took five cruisers off the road, so you're still down one police vehicle. Um, they were promised new guns. They were promised uh, computers in the cars which has all made the public eye saying that we're going to put computers in the cars, we're going to update all the systems within this department, and none of this has ever happened. And I did speak with J.J. Uh, Murphy, and uh, he told me that the computers have been sitting in City Hall for 18 months now. And the program that they bought is actually a leftover 2007 thing from uh, the New York City Police Department. And our IT guys in the city are currently going through it, taking out lines of text because it's not pertinent to the city. And I think in any line of defense in public safety, you need the proper equipment to do your job in a safe manner, whether that's police, fire, ambulance. Which while we're on the subject, I just want to bring up with the fire department, one of my biggest complaints about that is you have two firehouses in the city of Wilkesbury, which they run fire trucks out of. You have a third one up on High Street, which is two blocks from my house, so this is kind of personal to me, that rumors have been fluctuating that they want to sell this and get rid of it. But during the flooding, I mean, this was the only firehouse that is not in a flood zone. This was the hub of action. Everything was dispatched, and that was their command center. So how could you look into selling that or getting rid of that when it's the only one that, you know, is feasible at times. So during, during normal operations, there is no dispatch from that particular? There's only ambulance center. dispatch from there. There's no mm -hmm. fire. Got it. I mean, from a management point of view, could you set up temporary dispatch somewhere else? I mean, if it, if it meant close, you had to, had to cut back on costs somewhere, and you could set up a command center somewhere else. Oh, yeah, they did it, I mean, during the police, flood. Police have to, too. Yeah, I mean, they did it during the flooding two weeks ago. I mean, right. they set up a command center up at Cole Street Park. Right, so, but that you, don't, you wouldn't need to keep High Street, but High Street open for an evacuation that happens you know, once every five years. You could, you could go somewhere else. Yeah, you could. I just don't think it's a very good idea. But would you keep, open, keep, in high, keep high Street open for something that happens every five years? It's more than just the flooding you know, that I think the station should be open. I mean, the city themselves paid a contracting company to go in and do a survey of the residents, the homes, and everything, and the, they came back and said that we need a run on 17 uh, firemen, you know, at any given time. And the mayor just blatantly said, well, we don't like what you have to say, and we're going to cut it down to 14. So why would you pay all that money for a study and then just, you know, go back on what they come to you and propose. I mean, he has every right to do that, but, you know, why would you do that if you're not going to take their advice? It, it had a, it, wasn't there a study on the response time that it had, it had minimal effect on the response time from the other stations to the neighbors? That was one of the studies, yeah. Are you familiar with that, that they, that they did um, make sure that people in that part of the city still had adequate fire protection if there was a call on a fire, engines could still get there within minutes. I mean, I, 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 I did hear that. 
So, I mean, I probably... Well, I, I believe that's possible, but, I mean, if you've got a structure fire like when the Murray complex broke down and all of your... or burnt down, and all of your fire trucks are tied up, I mean, what do you do when you have a house fire up in, you know, North End or on the other side of the city? And that's the reason I think that, you know, getting back to the residents paying taxes, I mean, that's a basic service for the city. One of the more recent developments, I will ask your opinion on uh, the situation with the hotel stir. What are your what are your thoughts on what's occurred there and, and what the future of that building should be? I haven't been in the building and I don't know. I mean you're taking it for what an engineer said it's worth. I mean I just don't agree with the fact that right now City Vest wants to file for a FEMA grant for flood damage, stating that that's like the straw that broke the camel's back. This is why this building needs to come down. I mean, the building's 114 years old. I know a lot of people have a sentimental attachment to it, but is it worth saving, in my opinion? I mean, I look at the outside, I don't know. But I would like to see it refurbished, and we've already given City Vest between the county and the city, I think, $8 million, and there's nothing to show for that. I mean, this is what I'm talking about with wasteful spending. I mean, you're investing in this building, you know, and nothing's been done. But now the city wants to get FEMA money and take it away from people whose homes have been lost in this flooding and destroy the building. I, I don't agree with that. I mean, technically, yeah, it's smart on the mayor's part. This way we don't have to pay to get the building demolished. But is it ethical? No. Has there been paperwork filed on that? Is it or is it an assumption on our part that maybe they'll do that? I, from what I read in, you know, both newspapers, I'm there. You plan on filing for a FEMA grant? I don't know if it's filed. I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's been filed. Okay. And I think they had to inspect it, and that's part of the process. And then go for it. If they can determine that the water damage somehow damaged the building further, to, or it's a danger that it might collapse, then maybe they can qualify. Well, another question I'd like to just bring up on that is. I mean, it was a week ago, uh, was it last Saturday or Sunday, that they said that the building is structurally unsound, it's going to collapse, it's going to fall down. Why did the city wait until Wednesday afternoon to put barricades up around the Hotel Sterling? So it wasn't in jeopardy of falling last Sunday, but now Wednesday it is? Other people have asked that question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some of, a lot of the things that I've got going on in my mind are just like common sense. I mean, you don't have to be a mayor of a city to ask why. Why would you want to do this? You know, like, for example, I mean, I'm just going to go out there on this, but the Coal Street Project, okay? Did anybody take into consideration, I mean, you're going to make five lanes, a super highway. You've got children in a park playing there. You've got kids crossing the street to go back to Heights Elementary School. I mean, and now these kids are going to have to dart across five lanes of traffic. There's no parking. What do you do when there's a fire or an ambulance or any kind of, you know, safety vehicles are needed on that street? I mean, I know, for example, um, this came from my husband. They had a call on Cole Street, and he had to park on Mead Street. So you have to drive around the block to respond to any kind of emergencies on that street right now, and there's not going to be any parking there. So you're making five lanes there, but then they're proposing to make River Street down here, which was an evacuation route out of the flood zone, to two lanes, one lane each way, with left-hand turning lanes, which Bill was there when I was at that meeting also, and I addressed my concerns with the state on that. So, I mean, you just kind of have to look at the common sense ideas and go, what, what are you thinking? Other questions from the group at this point? Yeah, I'd like to go back to the campaign just because how much do you expect to spend? What do you think your total spending will be? Whatever I bring in, <laughs> which guess maybe 2000 okay. Yeah, not much. Any other questions? Anything that we didn't ask you that you particularly want to mention or anything that you want to emphasize? Um, no, but the only thing I would like to do is leave these with you on my way out because I did, like I said, I went online and I did a lot of investigation of how other cities are bringing revenue to their towns and different you know, ideas I have for the city that maybe you might we'll think of later on. <laughs> Well, I've got a whole page of them, you know, okay. and some of them we've already gone over and some of them we haven't. Like, um, for example, up in Archibald, they've applied for a grant 
uh, for LED traffic lights that are said to save 80% on your electricity value. But, I mean, if this is a grant that's out there, I mean, Wilkesboro has enough traffic lights, you know, let's look into something like that. Um, here, offer uh, public access to the police indoor shooting range for a fee. I mean, it might be minimal revenue, but I mean, this way you don't have to drive out to 118 or Susskind Road, you know, to go to a shooting range, and a lot of men would probably like that. Um, the city gas pumps, for example, um, they should only be for city vehicles, not personal vehicles. I would never take my car up there, even if I were mayor and fill it up. I mean, that's... Are the personal vehicles being used? Yes. Non-city employees? No, city employees. Using... Yeah, they're city employees. Do you pay for the gas? No. And that was something that was looked into a couple years ago. I believe the state did an investigation which kind of just went away because I believe there were a lot of gallons of gasoline missing up at the pumps. Okay. I mean, is that at the public works facility? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said about the tax cuts to bring employers into the city. I mean, that would, as another idea. I mean, and use the land we have now for special events and functions. I mean, the farmer's market every Thursday is great. I mean, you have the Cherry Blossom Festival over Kirby Park. We have so much land in this city. Use it. I mean, you know, you, if you go to Scranton, I mean, you have the Italian Festival up there on uh, Labor Day weekend. I mean, that place is packed. I mean, it's got to be bringing revenue into the city. I mean, and then when you bring these people into the city, they're going to shop downtown and they're going to eat downtown, you know, and generate more but so I can leave these with you if okay thank could you, you uh, look over I'm sorry them. could you flush sure. out the tax cuts I don't think we talked about that in any detail to bring employers into the city what are what are your thoughts there uh, to bring employers yeah I thought you said employers into the city Maybe I misheard you so businesses um well I just give them tax breaks for the most part but I mean you know try to get them to stay past the four-year tax cut deadline I mean, I have nothing against the colleges downtown, but, you know, from what I understand, they don't pay taxes. And it just seems like we cater a lot to them, you know. Okay. Anything else? Um, no. Okay. Thank you very much for being here to have a conversation. We appreciate it.